It's the Farmer to Farmer podcast, episode 80, and this is your host, Chris Blanchard. Don LaRoe raises about four acres of certified organic flowers at Zephyros Farm and Garden in Paonia, Colorado, in addition to about an acre of vegetables, plus some fruit trees, and quite a bit of pasture. He and his wife, Daphne Yanakakis, emphasize quality flowers and exquisite design to cater to florists and farmers markets in the resort communities of Telluride and Aspen. Don digs into how Zephyros gets excellent visual quality and shelf life without the preservatives that most flower growers use, as well as how they market their certified organic flowers. Don shares some tips and techniques for maximizing sales to florists, as well as the nuts and bolts of how they set up and run their farmer's market stand to generate a buzz that really helps them move their blooms. We get into the challenges and advantages of producing flowers in the desert western slope of the Colorado Rockies. And Don and Daphne have a strong emphasis on design, and Don describes the ways that they've worked to maximize the results they get from their design work, from training employees in the art of flower design to the business structures and marketing processes they've implemented. I learned a ton from talking to Don, and I think you will too. Thank you for joining us for the conversation. The Farmer to Farmer podcast is made possible with the generous support of Vermont Compost Company, founded by organic crop growing professionals committed to meeting the need for high quality compost and compost based living soil mixes for certified organic plant production. VermontCompost.com. The Farmer to Farmer podcast is also brought to you by you. We've got three new ways for you to support the show. I'll have more information for you at the break, or you can just head straight over to farmer to farmer podcast.com slash donate if you can't wait. Don LaRoe, welcome to the Farmer to Farmer podcast. Thanks for having me. So glad you could join us today. I think it would be great if we could start off by having you tell me a little bit about Zephyros Farm and Gardens and what you're doing out there in Paonia, Colorado. Yeah. Well, thanks for having me. It's really great to be here. Um, We have uh, been on this 35-acre farm since uh, 2003. My wife, Daphne, and I um, farm it. Um, And it's about, uh, there's about 17 acres in hay, about five acres in flowers and vegetables. There's an acre in sort of fruit trees that were here before we got here. And then the rest of the land is kind of wild, wild areas. And Paonia is on the the western slope of the Colorado Rockies, right? Yeah. So if you think most people know where Denver is, we're sort of like at that same mile high elevation, but we're on the other side. So we're looking to the east up into the Rockies and the west, we pretty much look out into Utah. I actually spent a couple of years in Aspen shortly after I graduated from high school doing the, well, I wasn't very good at it, but doing the ski bum thing. And and we drove over to Telluride, Colorado once and drove through Paonia. And it was actually largely responsible for me deciding that I was going to go out west and go to school at a at a place that had a working ranch on the at the college. And then which is what ended up actually leading me into into market farming. And so I always I always think very fondly of that area and kind of driving through there and going, wow, this is where this is where cowboys come from. <laughs> well, and we definitely have a lot of cowboys here still. And I'm, you know, I'm glad we do because it keeps the land um, open and keeps it in production agriculture. Although it's kind of getting discovered, this area was, you know, when we got here, the land was still somewhat affordable to buy something that had good irrigation water, which is, of course, key out here in the arid west, because essentially I live in the de- in the high desert. So, yeah, and we're about two hours from Telluride, two hours from Aspen. And, you know, a lot of coal mining out here as well, although that's uh, starting to dwindle pretty quickly, which has been interesting to watch and um, how it's affected the ranching community. But they... They are, our valley hosts the, the most um, organic uh, farmers per capita of any place in the state of Colorado. Um, so we, we've got that going for us, a good good community of growers here, that's for sure. And you market your products there in Paonia? You know, we sell a little bit of stuff around here, um, but mostly we're going over to these um, communities, these tourist communities like Telluride, Aspen, Carbondale, the Roaring Fork Valley, Vale Valley places that, you know, some of your people think of as ski areas, which they are, but they're also very popular destinations in summer, huge uh, destination wedding places, and, um, you know, tons and tons of really great high-end restaurants and people, uh, chefs looking for really high-quality food and unique food and local food and organic food. So it makes, it's an, always an interesting deal selling to tourist towns because they, uh, in particular, these towns have mud seasons as they call them, when the snow melts and before the snow really starts to fly. And literally the towns, I mean, you know, restaurants shut down. I mean, people just leave town. Um, So 
it, it makes, uh, you know, selling in late October, November very difficult. And like late March, April, early May is also a very challenging time of year uh, for us to sell products. So we've kind of had to adapt to that too. Now, most of what you guys do is cut flowers, right? Yeah. So of the five acres that we're doing intensively, about four of it is in um, is in uh, cut flowers. And how are you marketing those flowers? Well, we have a small CSA, which is mostly our local um, flower thing. And then we get a lot of people just calling, picking up bouquets here at the farm for, you know, events, a friend's birthday, whatever. Um so we have that sort of our our local our local biz. We have a couple of wholesale accounts in town. We do um, early in the week on Monday. We just got finished pulling um, stems, bunches of flowers, and making bouquets for florists and designers. Um, whole, so sort of a whole more of a wholesale market. Um, I mean, not a totally wholesale market. Not like the big flower houses that are in Denver who are really really selling wholesale. Um, so it's a price wise, it's a sort of a, a tick above that. Um, but it's a great, great market for us. Um, and we built up that clientele to really, uh, like our flowers. And then, um, we do two farmer's markets. We do the Aspen farmer's market and the Telluride farmer's market for uh, Friday and Saturday. And I noticed on your website that you guys were reaching into the Roaring Fork Valley where Aspen is and up into Telluride for the CSA program, did that take off and fly for you guys? You know, it hasn't really, um, you know, part of it is that it's, you know, it's where we do the farmer's market. So we haven't put as much energy in trying to do this CSA up there. Um, Cause they already come and buy flowers from us at the farmer's market. We really do want to build on that. Cause I, we, we really, it's a nice sort of, obviously the early season income, if you can get people to commit like that, and then, and just sort of it builds builds loyalty. And there's some towns that we don't that are you know people are not coming to our farmers markets from those towns, and and they're more you know year round towns as well. So you know uh, the farmers markets and the wholesale has just been been a better thing for us. And then we do a lot of uh, wedding design work as well. So that is sort of you know the most high end thing we do, the most um, value added portion of our farm. We're always trying to find ways to, you know, take not very many flowers and add a lot of value to them. And so that's where we've gotten into doing weddings and we've done the, um, been doing weddings for probably about eight or nine years now. Um, and a lot of them are, you know, people just coming, wanting us to do a bridal bouquet and a boutonniere, and then they pick up both flowers to do for their tables. But um, over the years, we've been doing more and more, um, you know, bigger full sale, full full service weddings. And are those primarily happening there in Paonia, or are these things that you're you're taking into those higher end communities like Aspen and Telluride? Both, mostly up in the mountain communities, although um, we have done um, a bunch of weddings down here. Um, it's certainly a great place to get married, and we do do weddings on our farm as well. I mean, we don't do a lot of. It sort of takes a unique couple to want to bring all their friends and family onto a working farm and get married. I mean, we have some really beautiful spots for a ceremony and um, and the rest of it, but it, and Peonia's is far away. <laughs> We're just far away from everything, you know. Um, it, we tell everybody it takes four hours to get here no matter where you're coming from, so. That's right. <laughs> um, so, yeah, mostly it's up in those, those um those mountain towns have a you know tremendous amount of sort of destination wedding traffic. I'm curious how how your business roughly divides out between the different ways of marketing the flowers and then also the vegetables. Well, so uh, for the flowers, I would say that our farmers market probably account for about sixty percent of our income. Um, the weddings probably about ten percent, and then thirty percent. Um, off of the wholesale accounts, although we and we've been moving to where it's more wholesale um, each year and more weddings each year, um, and that's that's by design. Uh, we love the farmers markets, but it's also it's a lot of work for you know the same amount of money. Um, it, it depending you know depending um, that we can get by doing a day's worth of deliveries up to the florists and designers. Um, because, you know, we can, the, the nice thing about doing what we do is that, you know, these, these people are used to getting a list from their wholesaler and it's whatever you can put on a jet from Colombia or Ecuador or Mexico or Florida or California and ship in. 
And there's a lot of things that we can grow and cut them. We cut them this morning. They're in our cooler. They'll get loaded onto our truck tomorrow, and they'll be designing with them by tomorrow afternoon. And then you can there's a lot more available plants that you can grow for people, a lot more cut flowers that, you know, um, that they just can't get from their wholesale market. So we can sort of charge whatever we want up to a certain extent for those types of flowers. And zinnias is a great example of something that doesn't last very long. And just the quality. I mean, it's not being shipped in. So it's uh, that's sort of the, the part that we've been growing the most. And then we were also really putting a big push into growing our wedding business. For the flowers, I mean, for the vegetables, we are actually only selling them at the Telluride Farmer's Market. And then we were working with a young couple here who just started a business called Farm Runners. And they are basically um, sort of a middleman um, business, which is really great and really has been needed in this community because doing all that traveling, um, you know, two, two to three, four hours to, to the market is, is a, is a burden. And then you're not on your farm, you're not farming. And so they stepped in and they are buying up, uh, products from, you know, dozens of farms in the area and bringing it up there. And so we really, it's great for us. They can deal with all the chefs. A lot of the chefs know us because we've been selling to them for years, and so they buy our product. But through these guys, and these guys get a, you know, have a have a new business, and it seems like it's working out pretty well for them. And that way, we can sort of stay more focused on the the niche marketing of our flowers, and and let them just sort of come and pick up bigger quantities of produce from us, and and get that out the door that way. I'm kind of curious why you still do the vegetables. I mean, it seems like, the, you know, we, I mean, like, you know, on my farm, I mean, we, we, you know, we did, we did vegetables. We also did a huge business in fresh herbs. We also for several years did a, a substantial cut flower business. And I remember that they all, well, they all had a different workflow to them. They were all very distinct enterprises, far more different than say growing carrots and green beans, you know, herbs was, was its thing. And, and then flowers was just another thing. And, and, you know, when you talk about like the flowers being so such a big part of your business, why monkey around with the vegetables? Well, I mean, it's a great question. It's definitely a question we ask ourselves um, almost on a year, well, really on a yearly basis when we go to decide what the heck we're going to plant next year. Um, and you know, uh, even even three or four years ago, we grew um, a whole lot more vegetables. And not necessarily acreage-wise, but diversity-wise. Although there was a point where we probably really were more, you know, half and half acreage-wise in terms of vegetables and and flowers. And then, you know, even longer than that, when we first got going, we sort of grew cut flowers right away. But, um, you know, we had, you know, we were trying to grow every vegetable under the sun. And we definitely don't do that anymore. We're very focused in what we grow. We grow fava beans. We grow fennel. We grow tomatoes, eggplants, peppers, melons. Uh, watermelons. And that's pretty much it. It's not that we don't have green beans out there to feed our interns, but we put a little patch in and everybody gets to pick whatever they want to eat. You know, same with peas. And, um, you know, and sometimes we have a hard time. We, you know, we supposedly only grow kale for ourselves, but, you know, when we put in like two one twenty eighths of kale, it winds up being more than <laughs> what we're going to eat. So, um, you, you know, it's hard to, hard to stop growing, uh, so much, so many vegetables. And honestly, we really do love growing the vegetables. Um, and we love growing the food and having the food and particularly in our Telluride market. I mean, they're, they're just dying. They're waiting for our tomatoes to show up, which they're just starting to trickle in. Um, and because we, we grow really unique varieties and we really pick them just ripe, really, really ripe. Um, and, and they love that and they, they eat it up and we can definitely charge a premium for it. So, you know, it's, it's been part of the mix that we're, you know, we've definitely talked about just, you know, why are we even thinking around vegetables at all? And we just can't seem to let go of it. Um, we've definitely though found, you know, the crops that we're not competing on kale and head lettuce and, um, chard and mustard greens at the farmer's market early in the season because there's dozens of other growers and that's all everyone's bringing at that time of year, particularly out here. It's hard to show up in June um, with anything besides that. Whereas with the flowers, there's a ton of cold season flowers that, you know, we start planting our high tunnels in February. By the end of March, um, we have four 30 by 100 high tunnels. They're all planted um, in flowers, except for a couple beds that we leave for tomatoes that happen in April. And um, so we can show up in June with a full array of 
of flowers. What kind of flowers are you doing with that early production? We uh, we do um, snapdragons. We do dianthus. We do um, ami. We do orlia. We do docus sweet peas. We do a bunch of sweet peas. We've got a great market for sweet peas. Um, Lysianthus go in the greenhouse. Um, lilies go in the greenhouse. Um, and then a little, there's, we're always trialing something. We did some carnations this year, which we probably <laughs> won't do again. Although there are some really sexy carnations out there. They just weren't these ones. Um, but although, you know, some people, some people have loved them. So you never know what you think is pretty and what someone else thinks is pretty is, is always two different things. Um, and then a lot of those crops are done. I mean, we're, we are now turning beds over. Um, this is, you know, end of July. So we're, we're ripping crops out and, and turning beds over. Um, and we've got starts ready to, to replant. And then we'll have those go into late October, November. Okay. And again, with the, with the cooler weather crops so that they're blooming on those shoulder seasons. Yep. Yep. Calendula is another one. Calendula, Godisha. Well, there are a couple others. You guys are certified organic, right? We are certified organic, yep. And our flowers are certified organic, too. For, for years, we just sort of didn't certify them because, it's, it's, um, frankly, it's a pain in the ass, in part because there is no organic flower market. Not, and I don't necessarily mean, although it's also true of the, you know, there's not like a florist who says, well, I only buy certified organic flowers because they wouldn't buy any flowers if that were the case. Um, but really it's also that the suppliers are not supplying certified organic um, seed or bulbs or um, so there's a lot of issues to deal with. So we are a certified organic farm, although we have parts of our farm that um, are in parallel production um, and not certified. Diane, this is a, a really good example because it comes pelletized and, you know, it's not like Johnny's catalog where I get to choose if it's organic pelletized, you know, or not. Um, it just comes the way it comes. And so I'm actually working, you know, with my certifier and um, the seed company to figure out if it's, um, you know, if those inner ingredients, it's not, it doesn't actually, they're not pelletizing it for, um, apparently with this one seed. Now there's other seeds, obviously, that they do pelletize for things like fungus and, and different diseases and and uh, stuff like that, but these guys are not supposedly. So there's a lot of like there's a lot of legwork that you have to do to try to figure out what is and is not acceptable um, by organics. And you know, and I obviously I send some of the stuff off to my certifier, and they they make those phone calls and they ask for that information and figure out what's acceptable or not acceptable. And lily bulbs are another example that is a really hard one for us where uh, it's. It's hard. You just can't find certified organic lily bulbs, and the companies we work with won't tell us what we, what what happens to them when they come into the country. So maybe they're treated, maybe they're not treated. So it's it's a really interesting thing for us. Um, we really like to try to push that market. I really feel like florists are the ones who need to be clamoring for organic product because they're the ones who are touching and cutting and smelling and dealing with this stuff. But flowers are an interesting thing. Food's kind of a no-brainer for organic because you eat it and it's healthier for you. That's that's a pretty easy argument to make. But flowers, it's sort of like, well, well, what do I really care? And for for us, it's a really interesting way to engage in a discussion of, well, yeah, you smell a red rose and you give it to your girlfriend and she sniffs it up and you know she's sucking all these pesticides up into her nose. That's not super loving. But at the same time, you... Um, are able to talk about the fact that really it's not necessarily about just the fact that you eat it. It's about how farming is being done around the world and who is out there in Ecuador, Colombia, you know, spraying toxic chemicals so that you can have a fresh rose to give to your girlfriend. Um, so it, it, it allows us to really have a, a different conversation about organics and, and why, why people should be supporting organic farming and, so even my inspector looked at me this time and said, you know, you could just not certify your flowers and it would be a lot easier. <laughs> <laughs> I said, I know, that's how we did it for years. But uh, I just don't feel like, you know, you got to kind of kind of push push the system and um, 
and you know these seed companies and the companies that uh, supply all the products, the little packets of stuff that people put in their flower water and all the preservatives that go into that part of the industry. I mean, it's essentially these flowers are being embalmed and it's really, it is exactly some of the same chemicals um, in that water that they use to embalm people. And they're not really nice chemicals. And um, you know what? We spend, you know, hundreds and hundreds of bouquets every week to market and, and all our customers just can't believe how long they last. And we add nothing to the water. We are really immaculate about how we clean our buckets and we are really strict about stage of harvest. And we really very, very rarely get complaints about um, flowers, you know, not lasting long. In fact, it's a problem. They say, oh, my flowers are still good. I'll, I'll be back next week. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> you know, this is a good problem to have, though, right? Yeah. Oh, no, I'm not complaining about that for sure. Just to dig into a, into that a little bit, you said you're you're really immaculate about bucket cleaning. So cleaning totes, cleaning buckets is one of those tasks that nobody really likes to do. And, and I feel like, you know, my experience on, on my own farm and then watching what happens on other farms, it's really easy for people to do a half-ass job of cleaning buckets and totes. And, and this is a big issue in the food safety world, right? You want to be able to, you know, you want to clean up the bacteria, clean up any potential contaminants, um, the same reasons that you would want to do that in the in the flower world, different implications. But how are you guys getting those buckets clean and making sure that, and more importantly, I think making sure that the people that are, that are doing the bucket cleaning are meeting your standards? Well, um, yeah, it is a good question and it really is true. And there are definitely times where, um, you know, the first part of the season we work with our, you know, with our interns um, and employees and really work with them to, to, show them how we want it to look, how we want it to be done, and to try to help them get their speed up. Because, of course, when you're washing, you know, hundreds of buckets a week, um, you you can spend a long time doing it, And but we don't have a long time to do it. So it's, not only does it have to be done sort of in a very anal way, it's got to be, be done quickly. Um, and then, uh, you know, then there'll be times where we go back and we look at buckets and we're like, oh, you got to wash them all again. You know, like this this didn't happen correctly. Um, but really, we're just using it's just soap and water and elbow grease um, and a lot of scrubbies, a lot of scrubbies. And um, and we have a triple wash sink that we had originally gotten for, you know, washing greens. And, and now it's really our bucket washing station. Um, you know, they make machines to do that kind of stuff. But that's a, a little pricey of a piece of equipment for us to to get um, at our scale, at least at this point, but we, we've thought about it, but um, you know, so you just got to sort of keep checking and double checking. And, um, and, and then I, I really think in, in making, making them understand too, why, why is it so important that, that this bucket is clean? And, and, and once they, once we really start to harvest, they really see how, how many times these buckets um, come back. And then, you know, the buckets, we're, we're not trying to leave buckets sitting around for very long. So they're hopefully not growing too much nasty stuff. And of course it happens with some things um, where things will sit around for a week or two, but ideally they're, they're getting moved, um, you know, from the field into the coolers and out to market, you know, in a week, uh, you know, 10 days at the most couple things, maybe a little bit longer than that things that can actually, you know, hang out uh, longer. So the, the buckets aren't getting that dirty also. I think that's part of it. And are you washing those buckets then between every use? Oh, yeah. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I mean, even if it we just doesn't even matter if it's just the flower's been in it for, you know, even 20 minutes. I mean, it's hard to keep track of what's, you know, if something got moved from one bucket to another bucket or consolidated. And then is that bucket clean or is that bucket dirty? It's always assumed to be dirty and it makes it easier to clean the next time. And so it keeps the job happening more quickly. But that way, we're also not ever getting buildup of, of stuff. And that way we don't have to use any of the preservative or the food or any of that stuff. So a lot of the flowers, you, you can really grow them um, organically very easily. And then um, people add all this stuff to the water. And now you've, you've ruined any ability for it to be um, certified. So, uh, you know, I'm sure our florists get our flowers and they plunk them into water that's got all sorts of stuff in it. And, and that's kind of, that's, that's their deal. That's their business model, you know. But that's where we're trying to present a different option and and show people that it can be done differently. And that's that's part of why we really believe in in having our flowers certified organic, 
And we do get calls, you know, people want, brides want certified organic flowers for their wedding cake, that sort of thing. Um, we're a little further away from people sort of saying, oh, I want organic flowers because that way I know, you know, someone in Ecuador isn't spraying nasty stuff on the planet. And then you said the other the other key for you with base life is is cutting the flowers at the proper stage. Yeah, stage. I mean, I to me, it's almost that stage of harvest is is more important. You know, all the people at the farmers market are like, "Oh, did you cut all of this this morning?" Or <laughs> did you cut all? Of we have you know eighty buckets of flowers at the farmers market. We're like, "No, that didn't happen this morning." But it happens every day. Someone is cutting flowers every day. Um, some days a lot more. The days before, we're going to make a bunch of bouquets or fill orders. Uh, we're cutting things, you know, there's a lot of things that really do want to get cut basically the, the same day or, you know, the day before they're going to get sold um, and they can hang out. It just depends. Some flowers, you really got to get them right when they open at the right time. And if you do, then they'll last a week or two, no problem. Um, and and if you don't, then you miss you miss them. And then they're, you know, you, you just miss, miss the stem that you're not going to be able to sell or use in a bouquet. So, you know, it's from a market marketing standpoint um, in terms of being able to make sales. And then it's also, um, you know, it's like, a, it's like a melon. You don't want to pick it when it's past its prime and you don't want to pick it, you know, when it still has no flavor. You know, the same same thing holds true with flowers. Um, and we grow a lot. I mean, we grow a thousand different varieties, over, well over a thousand different varieties of flowers on this farm. Now, it's easy to do when you grow a hundred different dahlias or, you know, three calendulas and, uh, you know, six different ornamental peppers. And, you know, it doesn't take long to get up to a thousand, but they all have their own stage of harvest. And how do you know? I mean, a thousand varieties, I mean, 40 different kinds of vegetables I can handle. I'm trying to think about a thousand varieties and I'm getting the heebie-jeebies with knowing <laughs> well, what luckily, I'm Well, there's pick other people who have been looking into this a lot longer than I have. Uh, we, we work really closely with the the ASCFG, the Association of Specialty Cut Flower Growers, which for anyone who's even thinking about growing flowers, it's probably the best 200 bucks you'd spend. Uh, and it sort of seems like, ooh, that's a lot to join an organization, but it's such a great organization of, of flower growers who, who look after each other. And they've printed um, some books, um, you know, and so over the years, um, you know, we've read all the books and, you know, there's still... Um, there is still uh, an Allen Armitage book um, that we use. Um, you know, we certainly give it to our interns and it's, you know, it's, it's a, a dirty old copy that, that gets shifted all around the farm so that they can look up what, what the right stage of harvest is. But even then you learn that over time, a, a lot of things you can begin to look because we do a tremendous amount of perennials and uh, we do a lot of perennials that aren't in the books. And so you sort of, you can begin to, to learn or, or get a good guess of, oh, this one is going to be sort of like a snapdragon or this one is going to be, you know, sort of like a, a dianthus or, or um, so you can sort of begin to understand by, you know, what, what is it the same family of, of plants or um, so over time. And then it also depends, you know, what market you're harvesting it for, um, you know, a fresh bouquet, you may want things to be a little more open because people want to enjoy it right away. But then again, some people want to buy the bouquet and have it last four days until they're having a party or whatever. So it's it's not that there's always a strict, it has to be exactly like this. Um, and then it's relative to sometimes when you have a, you know, when we have a huge flush of sunflowers coming off, we might start picking some a lot earlier than we would when we're just starting to see the first ones out of the high tunnel. So it's, it's, um, it's kind of a moving, it's, it's a bit of a moving target. I mean, there's definitely parameters that if you, you miss, um, you miss it, you really miss the prime prime of that flower, but, but there's wiggle room for most things. Now you just mentioned that you guys do a fair amount of perennials. I curious, what kind of percentage does that account for in terms of your production? So right now I would say we have probably about an acre and a half of our three acres of flowers and perennials. Wow. Um, and if anything, we're, we're moving m more and more in that direction. Peonies are a huge one for us. We probably have a quarter acre, half acre of peonies. Um, and, and if there's anything we go and put in three or four acres of, it would probably be peonies. Um, 
And then, uh, you know, my wife worked for a long time in the um, nursery industry, and it was sort of part of what got us on the road to growing flowers is that she really, really knew flowers and, and knew perennial perennials and growing perennials. So we're able to, you know, dig and divide and make more plants. We're able to take cuttings and and um, and use those as well um, to make more plants, not only for our little nursery sales, which is just sort of a, a, a small little business in the spring that we do, mostly just tomatoes and eggplants and stuff for people locally, but also some perennial flowers. But the thing about perennial flowers is with her experience, experience having she worked in Germany for a couple of years and then in England and on the East Coast and really got to know a lot of different plants is that we can try a, a tremendous amount of things and grow a lot of things that again you just aren't seeing them on the wholesale market in the flower world and they make our bouquets really unique and interesting and um, and then it, we become uh, you know uh, an interesting person to work with and from the florist standpoint, because we show up with really unique and interesting material all the time. You know, the bummer with perennials is they kind of have a quick season and it's like, you know, they they each have their season and it usually happens like right now we're harvesting Echinops and we have like eight buckets of Echinops and they're all, you know, and, and, and we probably have three or four more buckets to harvest and then we're done. And that's all. Maybe we'll get another flush of them in the fall a little bit. But um, so... They, you know, from that standpoint, it's it's you can't do them succession um, like you can say a sunflower. Although, if you really do want some perennials, you really can. You plant a new ba- a new patch every year, and then you'll get an early and a late. But it's still not, you know, not like every two. You can't plant them every two weeks because a lot of them are are um, need that cold from the winter to really to really do what they're going to do. How do you manage the weed control in those perennial patches? They are all in weed. They are in weed cloth. Okay. Yeah. We you would, cheat. We would be able to do do that without um without weed cloth. And you're using like a woven weed barrier fabric for that. You're not using just yep. standard stretchy black plastic. Nope. Yeah, we use the woven stuff, and we have a bunch of cardboard um pieces of cardboard with spacey holes spaced at different size, and then we just use a little plumber's torch, and we'll you know if we're putting it in a new bed, we'll just go roll it out and um, burn little holes on the, usually for most of our perennials, it's a, it's a, a three, three rows at 12 inches um, in a, about a 40 inch bed. And, um, and then we'll, we'll burn those holes and then we'll either dig it in or use rocks and, and uh, stakes. But we've, we've really, we can get up to 80, 80 plus mile an hour winds here. So mostly it's getting dug in. And then we're using um, hay in the in the pathways, but some places in the farm we can sort of just lay it out flat and use a bunch of rocks and sort of dig in the end if it's in a little more protected area. With the perennial flowers, how long when you when you plant a patch of perennials, how long do those stay in place? Usually, for for the majority of stuff, I would say we usually are leaving stuff in for three or four years. Um, And we're really trying to get, uh, we're really, that's a system that we're really trying to work on. Um, And and we're also, you know, previously we had planted things and we would put in, you know, 10, 20 row feet. And now, now we really know, and and with this sort of evolving into the wholesale market, we know how much of what we can sell. So we can begin to say, oh no, we really want a hundred row feet of, of this perennial flower. We want you know, uh, 200 row feet of this perennial flower. Now, some things like baptisia and peonies and, you know, some things are there, they are where we put them for, you know, decades. Um, But most of the stuff becomes not productive after about three or four years. And you really need to kind of dig it up and divide it. Um, Or, you know, and that's where we're really trying to figure out like how much is digging and dividing worth the time versus just getting some new plugs in. And, and starting over that way or doing a lot of it we can do by seed as well um, but some of the cultivars uh, you know you got to get as plugs because they're patented right and they, and they don't and they don't breed true to type a lot of the yeah, a lot exactly. of the perennials exactly but we don't have a ton of those around but we definitely do have them around um, you know a lot of the stuff we like to do from seed and a lot of it right now people are really into the wildflower look if you look at Martha Stewart and all these sorts of sources and that's a lot of the stuff that's very easy to do from from seed. Well, yeah, I would think that would be something with the perennials is that 
it must be a bit of a challenge to keep up with whatever's in style or in fashion at the time. It, well, yeah, and it, it is absolutely. And it is with flowers in general, you know, I mean, we're really paying attention to what the Pantone color is of the year. We're really, you know, we've, we've learned through other, other growers and designers to really be looking at, you know, what get by a, a Vogue and buy a Martha Stewart and buy a, you know, get some of these magazines and really see what, what's popular and really, you know, looking at the world of fashion because fashion kind of drives, drives all of the colors and all the style and all that sort of stuff. And so to really have a sense of, of which direction things are going. Um, uh, so, so I mean, so you guys are plagued by the same, the, when you talk about being in the world of fashion, you're plagued by the same thing that I run into. Like when I go clothes shopping with my, my teenage daughter and we can only find things in like three colors you know, that that's like all of the girls' clothes are in three colors and that's it for the year. You know, yeah. it doesn't matter where you go. It doesn't matter what brand. And you guys are kind of subject to that same We that are, same we effect. are. But, you know, in the end, it's like we have a lot of people come and help us make bouquets. And, and some of them are, are really good at it. And then uh, when we're teaching some interns, um, you know, they they don't make what we would consider a pretty bouquet. But, you know, in the end, they all get sold. So a little bit of it is in the eye of the beholder. Uh, you know, uh, beauty is in the eye of the beholder, but, um, but yeah, there's definitely trends and, and obviously the florists, um, have to play to those trends too. So for our wholesale market, so, you know, with your perennials, you're really just, um, it's a little scatter shot for us right now. We definitely know things that, that will sell. And so we're putting in bigger patches of stuff. And then we, you know, we're always got, you know, 10, 20 row feet of this, that, and the other thing that we're trialing a to see. Does it have a good base life? Can we get it to last? Will it grow here? You know, there's a lot of things that just, it's just too hot and dry for it to do well here, no matter how beautiful it is, um, you know, or is there a way to use it? If it only gets to be 10 or 12 inches tall, can we, you know, value add it in, into, into wedding work and, and have it, have it be worth growing, even though it's not going to go to some big florist. Because that's a really important trait in in cut flowers that I think oftentimes when I go to market, I'll see people having flowers in, you know, mason jars. And and it's really not the same as what you need if you're going into the wholesale market where you need those really long stems. You know, it's true to a certain extent. But, you know, a lot of these florists, they they're willing to buy something really unique and beautiful, even if it's not necessarily you know, uh, greenhouse, you know, Florida greenhouse length, um, because a lot of the designs they have to do are short little table things. So, I mean, a lot of times a tremendous amount of the, of the stem that gets sent to the florist gets cut, cut off and thrown away. You know, we're actually trying to figure out a way to see if we can get them to save some of that stuff and set it aside. But sometimes it's at such a volume that to really, to really get that stuff back to the farm, you know, and compost it. Um, so it's interesting. We are able to sell shorter stem stuff that I originally sort of been, then sort of commonly what you would think. I think it really is what you're saying is sort of the, it's the standard and certainly a lot of things they do want very tall and very straight. But I think, um, I think, you know, they're more willing to, to deal with sort of fun, funky stuff and things that aren't maybe perfectly straight. Um, you know, and part of that all also is about building a relationship with the florist and just being honest with them that when it goes on the availability list, we just, you know, say, yeah, this is, it's short. And, um, you know, and give them a little price break perhaps because it is, but um, but it's not that they can't use it. When you're marketing to florists, are you taking in buckets of bouquets or are you taking in buckets of one kind of flower? Um, How does that work? Both. We have a few florists that do buy buy bouquets for us and then they'll mark them up and sell them because, you know, some of these bu- uh, florists are like in the middle of the middle of Aspen. And so she wants to just have a lot of bouquets to, to sort of for people to grab and go. So she does. Um, mostly the florists are just buying bunches from us. Um, and, you know, spend a lot of time going to the wholesalers and really seeing how they sell flowers to really learn how to bunch flowers. And a lot of them, we just do a grower's bunch. Uh, we used to sort of count every single stem and we're trying to get away from that to save us time. And it was just calling it a grower's bunch. And it's, 
you know, it's about 10 stems for most stuff. Some stuff, maybe it's a little more. And other stuff, it's going to be a little bit less than it sort of looks. They all look about the same, a, a bunch. Um, and, um, you know, and then for us, what we, uh, we were really lucky last year to work with a local slow money group. And they lent us uh, $25,000 to go buy a refrigerated truck at a 0% interest loan, which was really awesome. Um, previously, we'd been doing it in a truck and trailer and driving around the small alleyways of, of these little towns um, or in our, our car when we didn't have as much stuff to deliver. Um, it just it wasn't working. And we really and now with the advent of the refrigerated truck, we're able to not only throw on what they ordered and have that set aside, but then the other stuff that you know, either came out of the field today and we have, well, we really have a lot of that. We throw a couple uh, extra buckets on and stuff that maybe they didn't order, but uh, a lot of times they're getting last minute orders. Um, they get a call in from a client who all of a sudden decided to have a big party and wants a bunch of flowers. And so they're like, oh my God, I need a bunch of flowers. So we have those on the truck. We invite them onto the truck. And then a lot of times the little odds and ends that we have, um, they're really excited to see them and try them out and have something different to design with that will help set them apart as well. And we can sell a lot. Anything we don't sell comes back. It's still nice and cold on the truck and we can stick it back in our coolers for our, you know, for our, for the next market. Um, and so that's, that's really um, worked pretty, pretty well. And I think it's uh, a great, great way to go because, you know, florists, they have a hard time saying no to a lot of these things and and they just get a ton of last minute orders. It's not quite like a chef who sort of knows how many dinners to expect to do every night and therefore how, how many, you know, cases of beets they need to order. It's not quite so well organized. They have their corporate accounts that they do every week for hotels and stuff, but they also have a ton of just, you know, walk-in stuff. And so that's, that's been really, really great for us in the, you know, Kudos to this local slow money group, and I highly recommend people uh, plugging into that slow money organization. And everywhere it's a little different um, how to get money out of the slow money groups in your area. And some areas might not even have slow money groups, but if you do, I definitely recommend checking them out because if you need a little capital, it's uh, could be a great way to go. So tell me a little bit about the refrigerated truck. Have you had to modify the box at all to work with the flowers? Do you have shelving in there? Yeah, or is we, it just... so we put a bunch of shelving in, um, not you know, to hold boxes of vegetables as well, but um, but it was definitely sized a little bit more for, you know, with the thought of, okay, what is a bucket of sunflowers and how tall is that? And, and um, so it's a, a little bit more set up for the flowers. And, and now we're using it also as our farmer's market vehicle. So it's got, you know, a space for tables and easy ups and cans, lots of different cans because we take everything. You know, we put a put on a show at the farmer's market because we really, we charge a, a premium. Uh, anyone who's been to the Pike Place Market in Seattle would be horrified to find out what, what we're charging for, you know, a bunch of flowers that for there you can get, you know, really cheap. Um, but, you know, we, you know, did a couple things. First of all, we looked at the market, like a market like Aspen and, and Telluride, and we said, well, where are these people coming from? And um, the reality is they're coming from Miami and L.A. and Manhattan and Houston and uh, a lot of second homeowners. And so we called florists in those cities and we found out what they were charging, and that's what we charge. And no one blinks at us. I had a had a grower from California come out and say, "Oh my God, your you know your bouquet. It's a, you know we were selling a, a large bouquet for forty bucks." I said, oh, that's just ridiculous. You can't charge that. I said, "Well, but if I sell them all, then I can." And that's really you know that's really the key. I'm like, I get it that you know in Davis you maybe can't you know you can. And but what you can grow, you know, flowers for in Gwinda or in, you know, the Skagit Valley, it's a whole, whole different thing in the, you know, 5,800 feet in the high desert. On that subject, I mean, you've mentioned several growing challenges that you guys have there in in the high desert in, in western Colorado. You've got, you said, 80 mile an hour winds, of course, desert, you've got extremely hot summers and and you've got dry summers as well. I'd like to just walk through each of those. How are you guys dealing with those 80 mile an hour winds? Because you can't have a bunch of bent over flowers. 
Well, so, um, you know, mostly we're pretty lucky. Our winds come tend to come earlier in the spring or late spring. Um, usually by, you know, early June, most of them are done. So by that point, things aren't super tall anyway. Um, we do use horizontal trellising on some things. And, you know, really we would probably use it on most things if uh, we really could have the time to put it on on um, on most of our beds we don't it doesn't tend to happen so we do sort of crucial crucial crops and then um, you know try to do as much as we can um, I mean so that's really how we deal with the wind and we have and we have high tunnels you know the four 30 by 100 high tunnels um, obviously the stem length coming out of those high tunnels is, is a lot better than than the stem length in the fields um, and part of that has to do with wind and, and, um, you know, and the wind, the wind also dries, you know, we really don't rely on rain at all ever to irrigate anything. Um, so we're, uh, we do not only do we have drip, but we also have two inch aluminum pipe sprinklers, um, so that we can move those around as well. So right now, you know, it's been in the upper mid to upper nineties. And sometimes the drip, it's just, you can't keep up with between the wind and the heat. And so it's really nice to be able to have those sprinklers and just really put down some water on the whole field, not just in the, in the area where the drip tape hits. Um, so we've noticed that that, that helps a lot and it allows us later, you know, early and later season to really germinate cover crop and that sort of stuff. So we have, so we have, you know, we, and then all our, all our pastures are flood irrigated. So that's, I'm constantly watering from April through October. And then I take a little bit of that water and throw it, throw it into the pond. And then we pump out of the pond out to the five acres on the drip system. Cause yeah, it just, it doesn't rain here. We get snow, we get 12 inches of rain annually. And most of that comes as snow. And are you doing anything to manage the heat? All our high tunnels get a shade cloth, usually about mid-May. It sort of depends on the season. If they all have 30% shade. As slowly they get destroyed, we've started to do the Illuminets, which we're really liking those. Um, but yeah, we definitely, shade cloth will be on until, usually until mid-September. And even with that, like our tomatoes, inevitably our tomatoes lose a whole flush of um, a fruit because it was too hot in the high tunnels for the, the pollen to take. So um, unfortunately that this year it happened the first flush because it kept us from having to bend over, but it also kept us from having those super early tomatoes. So, um, so it, you know, that's really all we can do. Um, the nice thing about Colorado is that it cools down every night. So every night we're back into the fifties. Um, so it's not, uh, you know, I complain about the heat, but I, I really don't have anything to complain about compared to most people. <laughs> the heat doesn't ever go away. <laughs> but the heat goes away every night here. We get these strong winds off the mountains uh, as the cold air kind of falls out of the mountains. So we're, we're pretty lucky that way. And, you know, from a disease uh, standpoint, and, you know, I was talking about being able to grow organic flowers pretty easily. Uh, it's true for me. It may not be true for you if you leave, you know, someone lives in a really wet, spot you're going to deal with diseases that we don't deal with out here you know our valley is a really renowned for uh, organic fruit apples peaches pears uh, cherries uh, apricots on a good year which we got those this year um, and part of the reason we can do so much certified organic fruit and certified organic flowers and even vegetables is that we just we really don't see the root disease problems you know very rarely do we get fungus issues because it's just it's too dry in the high tunnels, we'll deal with some of it, but um, are insect pests an issue at all with cut flowers? Um, they are, and this year, uh, in part because it was such a not a super cold winter, and then it got warm, and it's just never really. We didn't get any late season frost, which is great for apricots, but um, not so great for for the insects. So this year, we definitely we have a lot of grasshopper pressure. Um, we thrips are a particularly hard one. Um, for us, and that again, the overhead watering really helps with a, a couple of these earwigs can be pretty bad on dahlias, and we do almost 3,000 dahlias, so a little over a half acre of dahlias, so that's a big one, and thrips tend to be the bad one um, on those and grasshoppers. 
we're trying to plant more beneficial insects, attracting plants around our fields to sort of help with some of those issue. Um, and then, then really the overhead watering and um, in the greenhouses we'll do, um, we'll buy in beneficial insects. So uh, we do um, mostly lace wings um, and we're, um, we're trying, trying a couple new things for the, the thrips um, as well. I would imagine that the florists in places like Aspen and Telluride are are not going to be particularly sympathetic to having, you know, say some zinnias that the grasshoppers have chewed on. Yeah, no, I mean, the bugs really can ruin ruin a crop. I mean, it's a hard year for us with dahlias just because there is such such high insect pressure. And, you know, it, it's just the dahlia that's been chewed on isn't going to sell, so... And we don't, we wouldn't sell it. I mean, the thing is, is, you know, part of what we really built our business on and our, you know, not only our farmer's market clientele, I mean, we don't just charge $40 for a bouquet because it's a, you know, just a bunch of flowers slapped together like you get at Pike Place Market. I mean, it's a real design and it's done with really high quality flowers. We really pride ourselves on that. And that's what part of what makes um, makes us able to get a premium at the farmer's market and also makes us able to, um, have such good relationships with the florists as they know that, um, you know, they really can expect high quality stuff from us. We're not going to send them any secondary quality stuff at all. But I mean, sometimes when you get a, you know, an, an attack, I mean, with our dahlias, part of our plan is you just, we just grow so many that we're just, you know, I just went and cut a bunch back today cause they were getting mauled. So I just cut them back and then they push, they'll push new and um, eventually the plants can kind of start producing so many that they almost out out produce. But then the overhead watering really helps with the thrips a lot. And so I mean, we do get rain here and when it happens, it's really nice. It doesn't really account for much in terms of irrigation, but it really can help with, with the pest problems to a certain extent. With that, we're going to stop here, take a break, get a word from our sponsors, and then we'll be right back with Don LaRoe and uh, Zephyros Farm and Gardens. The Farmer to Farmer podcast is made possible with the generous support of Vermont Compost Company, makers of living potting soils for organic growers since 1992. In the transplant greenhouse, all of your investment in plant material, heat, labor, and overhead depend absolutely on the performance of the media where you expect your plants to grow. And that media has a really hard job to do. Produce a healthy plant in just a few cubic centimeters of soil. When I started farming, I focused on getting the cheapest ingredients I could to make my own potting soil, and later on finding cheap potting soil already put together. But I found out what so many farmers have, that saving money on inputs doesn't always result in increased profits. Jennifer at Vermont Compost can tell story after story of customers who switched to less expensive options, but who have come back to Vermont Compost for the consistency and the quality of their potting soils. And even though it's not all about saving money, Vermont Compost Fall Pre-Buy Program can help you get what your plants need at the best price with the best shipping options. Don't miss out. Vermont Compost Fall Pre-Buy Program runs September 21st to December 21st. Taking care of growers by taking care of transplants since 1992. VermontCompost.com And this week, the Farmer to Farmer podcast is brought to you by you, our listeners. And the nice thing about that is that I don't need to go on and on about it because the fact that you're here probably means that you already think that the Farmer to Farmer podcast is kind of cool. We'd love to have your support for the show. And we've put some mechanisms in place at FarmerToFarmerPodcast.com slash donate for you to do just that. One of the easiest ways is to use the link at farmertofarmerpodcast.com slash Amazon to do your shopping on Amazon.com. It doesn't cost you a penny more, and Amazon kicks a percentage of what you spend back to the show setting up a monthly donation to provide ongoing support for the behind the scenes efforts that you don't hear, but which make the show what it is. Plus, we've got a couple of cool gifts for you if you go this route. Or you can do a one-time donation at farmertofarmerpodcast.com slash donate. Or... Just keep listening, commenting, sharing, and reviewing. It's awesome that you're here, and I'm grateful for your participation in the podcast, no matter what way you choose to support the show. Go to farmertofarmerpodcast.com slash donate for more information and all of the relevant links. Thank you so much for your support. And we're back with Don LaRoe from Zephyros Farm and Gardens in Paonia, Colorado. Don, I wanted to I wanted to ask how you guys got started in 2003 and, and why flowers and, and why Paonia? Well, um, sort of easiest to start, you know, why, why Paonia? Um, we had been living in California. I uh, had a mushroom farm with some friends from college um, and growing shiitakes and maitakes. And um, we all had started falling in love and getting married and um, 
having babies. And, uh, we realized, uh, I realized that I didn't really want to stay in California, uh, being a native Coloradan. Uh, I really wanted to come back this way, uh, to be closer to family. Um, although we were looking all over the West really. Um, and, and the mushroom farming thing was awesome and a lot of fun. And that's a whole other episode but it's a lot of time in a laboratory and we, I really wanted to be outside and um, you know, and my wife really loves plants. And so that's what made us make the move. Paonia besides being in Colorado close to family is a, is a great little community, a lot of support here for organic farmers. So we knew that there'd be sort of a, a, a good community of growers here and we were really right. And then, you know, there's water. So uh, we were able to find a piece of property that had pretty good water rights. Um, you know, most, most years they're not going to turn our water off. Um, although it has happened, um, uh, we, we haven't had to really suffer too much, um, because of that. So that's how we wound up in, in Paonia. And, um, you know, in terms of, uh, the flowers, it, it really, it kind of happened organically in the sense that we, we were trying, you know, when we first moved here, we were growing eggs for, you know, we had a hundred lane hens and we were trying to raise turkeys and we had dairy sheep and we had goats and we had the hay fields and we had the vegetables. And of course we were trying to grow every single vegetable and try every groovy variety of every green and tomato and pepper and, um, and, and flowers as well. We were trying to grow all lots and lots of different kinds of flowers, putting in perennials, but also, you know, doing a lot of annuals. It really was the niche that, you know, in part the flowers spoke to us. We really, we really love that time. We love that design work, being able to work with the flowers and, and put them together and play with color and texture and style. And, and, and it was a niche that, you know, really there was, plenty of other people growing, you know, lots of different stuff. Although honestly at that time, uh, and part of the reason we still grow tomatoes is that, um, you know, we'd come from California where heirloom tomatoes, you know, had been going for years. And so we really knew, uh, what they were. And in Colorado, it was happening, but certainly not, um, not like it was out there. So we really had a a leg up on it on, in the sense of we just knew what the varieties were. And, and, um, and so we still, to this day, I mean, we mostly grow dark, dark tomatoes, green tomatoes, you know, funky tomatoes, you know, uh, trays of cherry tomatoes, you know, with lots of different shapes and sizes and colors. And, and, you know, and that's what people, people love, love about what we do. Um, but the flowers were, it was sort of, it, it, so it, not only from an economic standpoint did it really sort of begin to, to make sense, but it also just became a passion working with them. And then we were really the only ones doing it, you know. Was that a difficult market to grow, the flower market? Um, you know, not not when you're marketing in a place like Telluride and, and Aspen. I mean, in some sense, it it. it I mean, unfortunately, in America, to have flowers on your table, it's because it's really a, you know, you got to have a little expendable income. It's not something you do for yourself. Um, you know, a lot of places in the world, it's just part of part of life. You know, we have an intern from France this year, and it's just, you know, they're just they have flowers. You know, it's just part of part of what you do. You buy flowers for your, you know, feed your soul as well as your body. But um, in America, it's not quite like that. Um, so you do have to find a market where people have, a, have enough expendable income and, and figure out how to price, price your product appropriately for those markets. I know that, um, you know, not everybody lives around the corner from a, a high end market. The other reality of Telluride and Aspen though, is that we, you know, we, we do sell much cheaper bouquets and sell everything by the stem and people can, you know, buy $5 worth of flowers and have something really beautiful to take home. Cause obviously these towns have tons of workers who um, support all the second homeowners and stuff. And so we, we really consciously try to market towards those people as well. But um, so we, you know, we sort of have the gamut of, in terms of price, um, and, you know, I mean, we'll do a custom bouquet for, you know, $7,500 as well as having little $5 bouquets for, for people to take home for their tables or, or whatever. So, you know, and then that just sort of grew slowly over time. And I really think that over time we, we you know, I had 
had a bunch of art in my background and I think Daphne did a lot of garden design and really had a, a sense of, of that. Uh, we just had a design aesthetic, and so that really allowed us to make bouquets that really captivated and appealed to people. And then with the diverse product that we have to put in them, it really kind of, um, that's when it really took off to the point where, you know, we really became known as the flower growers as opposed to just sort of, you know, another grower down the road or, or whatever, so... So with so many of your sales happening at Farmer's Market, tell me a little bit about how that marketing setup works for you guys. Are you taking bouquets of flowers to market? Or are you taking uh, bun- grower bunches and, and making bouquets there? How does that work? On a given Thursday, we bouquet for both our markets and we make you know upwards of uh, 100 plus bouquets. Um, we, we have people in our community who we really... Um, have trained and who really also had sort of a, a good design aesthetic who we pay pretty well to come in on those days when we need to do design work. Um, interns will get to do that work a little bit, um, but most of them don't. It's, it's, it's a hard skill to have to do it well. Anyone can take a bunch of flowers and slap them together. And if you've got a little sense of color and style and stuff, but to do it really well and to do it quickly so that you can, you know, pull out, you know, a hundred plus bouquets in a day. Um, you know, it, it takes some skill. So it's definitely something we, we pay for. Um, and um, we'll bring those bouquets to market. We have basically two sides of $20 and a $40. And then sometimes when we have a lot of short material, we'll do a little $10. And then we usually have little things that we'll bunch up for five bucks. And then sometimes if we have a tremendous amount of something, we'll do some grower bunch specials. Um, so we always have a, a little stand that's just like the grower bunch, you know, $10 special. And it's a big bunch of, of whatever happens to be, you know, really in season this week. It's Rudbecky as the Black Eyed Susan. Um, and then um, usually we are, and then we're bringing stems of flowers up there. So we probably bring, you know, 40 to 50 buckets of flowers in addition to the ones with bouquets. And and then we put all those out on a stand. Uh, we sort of have a three-tiered stand um, and we put them into black cans and all these different cans. And then people can make their own bouquets. So they can pick them out by the stem. Um, it's really actually a, a better deal to buy a pre-made bouquet, but a lot of people have a, have fun just picking a few of these and a few of those and putting them together themselves. And then we're making bouquets. So we do custom bouquets at the farmer's market. That starts at 45 bucks. Unless we're really out of bouquets, which happens, you know, towards the end of the day, we can run out and there's still, we have a lot of stuff, a lot of stems and it looks, it's, you know, my line uh, the last couple of weeks, we've really just been getting, I mean, a tremendous amount of sales. It's been great. Um, it's like, oh no, there's still beauty to be had here. You know, it's just harder to, to see it and put it together on your own. But um, so then we we're constantly making bouquets as well. And that's part of the show is actually doing that in front of people. I mean, and with sales are going slow at all. I'll just pick up one of the pre-made bouquets and kind of work with it a little bit, maybe pull out something that's looking a little sad or add a different color in to sort of change it because maybe it's not really what people are wanting that week. You know, it's hard to sell fall colored bouquets at this time of year because people don't want to start thinking about fall yet. But sometimes we have a lot of red, orange, and yellow flowers around. So what are you going <laughs> to do? You know, stick some blue in there or whatever. And, um, and that, that show really brings them in as well. And nine times out of 10, they'll, they would prefer to buy the one out of your hand than one in the stand, even if, you know, <laughs> even if it was just in the stand two seconds ago, you know, they want to, and, and a lot of times you'll make one for somebody and then somebody else wants that exact same thing. <laughs> it's really, people are funny. Are you and Daphne working every farmer's market? Uh, no, right now. Um, Honestly, we quit the Aspen Farmers Market for a few years because it, it was uh, it's a hard one. It's a really hard one. A, it's really long. It's from uh, eight to three. Um, it's not a farmers market. It's an artisan market, um, and it just gets hot. And it's it's a challenge. You know, the people uh, there's a little bit of you know self righteousness about you know sort of um, uh, you know. That, that high-end society, I mean, they really are the billionaires. It's, 
the woman who runs the market um, sends an email and tells us that, you know, hey, there's a lot of jets in town. This should be a good market. Right. You know, like <laughs> it's not like your typical farmer's market. So it's a challenge <laughs> dealing with those people. So we started to do it again this year. We allowed, we got them to allow us to only do the uh, basically late June through Labor Day, not the whole market, which is another a bunch of weeks so I mean, into October and, and all of June where it's really very slow there, but it's also our busy wedding season. Um, and we have a friend who we're training to do that market. So ideally that um, Daphne and I don't have to do that market. And we're, right now we're sort of switching one. We'll, you know, I'll do Telluride and then the next weekend, you know, she'll do Telluride. And, but it's, you know, the, the challenge of having really, having uh, set an expectation of a certain level of design in our product is that it's not, you, it's not like you can just, you can't just hire someone like you can with vegetables because they can, you know, put, put a, a you know, tomato on a scale or, or count up how many bunches of beets you bought and, and add it up and tell you what it costs. You really have to be able to um, have to work with the flowers. And even just know what all the flowers are, you know, and that's that's the challenge. We're constantly testing our interns about what what their names are, and you know, and it's like the the seed catalog has one name, and the florist has a different name, and the common name in the nursery is a different name, and <laughs> and then someone from Texas calls it something else, you know. But uh, so you gotta you gotta have all 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 of that. So it is tricky because um, Daphne and I do wind up doing it, or we really have to have someone there who can really, when asked to put together a seventy five dollar arrangement, can do it, and and not blink. And also, a lot of our flowers, we say, you know, these flowers are anywhere from you know two to four dollars a stem, and it's a pretty arbitrary thing. What is a two dollar stem? What is a four dollar stem? And so you really you know, it's about quality, it's about length, it's about size, it's about all these different things, and every different flower has a different set of, um, you know, uh, criteria that allow us to say, okay, oh, this is a $4 stem, this is a $2 stem. Um, so uh, you, you just have to be confident when you say, you know, this is $25 worth of sunflowers and know that, you know, you charged them 5 bucks for this one and 3 bucks for that one. So I think this, the, this design aspect and training people about how to do the design and how to value a bouquet, those feel like variations on what a lot of vegetable farmers are really struggling with. You know, there's, there's always so many variables in, in what you're dealing with and trying to boil things down to how do you actually communicate that to somebody in a meaningful way so that you don't have to make every single bouquet on your farm. Have you, have you found some ways of talking about design that have worked for you guys? Yeah, it, it is certainly a challenge to train people. Well, they really have to understand the role of the flower in the arrangement. So, you know, we have what we call our money flowers, which tend to be lilies and sunflowers and dahlias. Uh, and those are things that we tend to sell by the stem to the wholesaler. Um, to our florist, and then you have your sort of secondary flowers, your calendula, your snapdragon, um, your saloisia, and then you have the filler flowers, you know, your fever few, your status, uh, you know, um, a bunch of different flowers, and so to really understand the role of those flowers, and it and it's hard, it, it takes a long time to figure out how to how to work, you know, some filler, if you don't start with it right away, it's, you can't just stick it into the bouquet because it's so big and sprawling and other filler, you just kind of want to sprinkle it around the edge of the arrangement. And so, um, you know, they really, they got to work with us quite a lot in what we call our flower den, which is our little shed with our walk-in coolers and uh, actually really, really nice. We've got to finally pour a concrete floor in there and put a little roof and painted it white. So it's not quite so much like an ugly like <laughs> den. it's actually a really nice place to work now uh and um so they they have to spend quite a bit of time with us in the flower den and and really um uh, a lot of these people do live in the community and a lot of them are really good friends of ours and we just have to be really critical and be like wow that's ugly or you really can't put that there or um look at the quality of flower you used and this is a big bouquet you just can't do that you know and um and you just have to be uh 
you know, very forward about all that sort of stuff. So that, and, and then they learn. And, um, and then going to the farmer's market, you, you really learn speed. Um, you know, so we, we eventually we try to crack the whip a little bit here and be like, okay, that was great. It's really beautiful. But now that took you five minutes. You can't take five minutes to make a, you know, (laughs) a $20 bouquet. It just, you got to be able to do that a little bit faster, you know? And then the other thing is when they start doing it, if they did a really nice one, we say, okay, make that again. And then we send one to one market and one to the other market. And then we also like when, when we're teaching our interns, you know, who we don't tend to keep around for more than a season. I'll just give them colors. I'll be like, okay, you're going to make a, you know, a white and yellow bouquet with a hint of salmon or whatever. And, and then they'll make that bouquet, you know, and I'll even tell them sort of what flowers. So they sort of get the sense of which ones to go for. And, and then, you know, the work area that we set up with this new concrete floor and, and a much lighter area and the way we set up our tables is, is a whole lot better. So the, before the workflow is really just, it was really bad. And we were sort of stumbling into each other and there was this like muddy slope that we were working on and it, and it's been a massive improvement to have this, have this, the workflow area just better. And we can sort of spread out the flowers in a, in a way that you're not really bumping into each other all the time and, and that there's, uh, you can have a lot more flowers out and still have room to box up tomatoes. That's helped a lot. My understanding is that you've actually started another business around design here recently. Yeah. So um, this year, um, you know, Daphne has been doing a lot of uh, design work with other designers around the country um, and really sort of trying to take our design up to that next level um, to where we really can do big weddings and um, do, you know, not just the bridal party stuff, but really all of the arranging and do really big installations of arbors and we have a wedding on our farm. We're going to do a wall of flowers. Um, so, so things like that. And, and so people don't really want to pay a farmer necessarily to do design. Um, they kind of think of a, of a farmer as a, a good way to get cheap flowers. Um, so we decided that we really needed to set our design part of our um, business uh, into its own business. So we started um, Studio Z Flowers, and that's... Um, you know, it's the, the popular hashtag in the farmer world is hashtag farmer floor. So that's kind of the floor side of our farm. And, um, you know, we're very clear that we get, you know, all the flowers from, from Zephyros Farms and, and we're not trying to pull the wool over anyone's eyes that it's not us. But um, over the years, slowly invested in having containers and vases and that sort of thing. And so um, we can, you know, rent that stuff and and really go up and actually you know, hand the bride her bouquet and pin the boutonniere on the groom and set up all the flowers and, and, and do that. And that's part of the refrigerator truck as well. So we can take all that stuff up and have it, have it really be in, in perfect uh, quality. We worked a lot on it this winter and got our logo on the website and, 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 uh, you know, we're constantly trying to take better pictures of the work that we do. We're really hoping that by this next wedding season, I mean, people sort of plan weddings pretty far in advance, um, particularly people who are going to spend a, a, a good amount of money on them. Uh, not that we don't always get brides calling up last minute, and sometimes we make bridal bouquets at the farmer's market, so you never know. But, um, <laughs> but um, really, it's next year, you know, this this sort of coming season that we're coming into in terms of, of people looking towards their wedding for, for next summer is, is what this um, is where we were sort of gearing up for it. So, so Don, I think you, you guys also have another venture that's new this year uh, around selling Dahlia tubers, right? Yeah, we do. The Dahlia tubers, uh, Dahlia's out here. We have to dig them up every year um, because otherwise they'd freeze. And so we have to dig them up and storm. We spend a lot, most of November basically digging and dividing Dahlia's. And so we wanted to, um, you know, now that we've got, we've got over I think this year we had 99 uh, different varieties that we put out there, and we really spent a lot of years focusing on on which ones do really well for cut flower production, um, and ones that you know we have ones that just they don't last that long, and that's just part of their deal. It's like you know you just 
not every flower lasts forever. You know, sweet peas, we, we grow those too, and they don't last, they don't have a very long base life. And, but we sell a ton of them just like dahlias. Um, and so, yeah, we are, um, selling dahlia tubers. We got our online store on the Zephyros Farm and Garden, uh, website. And, um, and it's been great because it, you know, helps uh, bring in money. Um, people are, you know, uh, it's cold and snowy outside and they're sitting inside thinking about, um, grown flowers. So they come to the website and, and order some tubers and then we ship them out, um, right around the 1st of April. And, um, so yeah, it's been a good, good little thing for us. And I think it's, you know, good for folks who want to grow cut flowers. And also just, I mean, we actually had a, we were had a surprising amount of sales from local people uh, getting online, even as they live, you know, 10 miles down the road from us and, and ordering a bunch up and just picking them up on the farm, but also shipped them out all over the country. So that was, that was pretty cool. Um, so to share, we definitely were, uh, have a serious passion around dahlias. So <laughs> we have a lot of them and, uh, and love to share that passion. So, and then it's also my understanding that, that you're the president of the board of the organic farming research foundation. I am. I recently, uh, took that, that post up after having, um, been on the board for six years now. And, um, you know, it's a, a, a great organization. I got, we got involved with, um, on farm research here on our farm through the specialty crops program, which actually helped fund our first high tunnel. We looked at growing early season cut flowers for um, for Mother's Day, and then we did a, a, a winter high tunnel uh, vegetable growing uh, project with uh, CSU, a, a professor at CSU, uh, in, um, through the Sayer program. So I got to know about sort of organic research and what's going on in the world of organic research and really got to know what OFRF was doing. And um, yeah, it's been really an exciting um, year for OFRF. We've gotten, um, we're just about to get out um, the national organic research agenda. So we look at sort of, uh, we did sent out a, a survey of to all organic farmers and and really try to figure out what are the research needs. And um, we do a bunch of research symposiums. And then obviously we also give grants out. So if people are looking for, um, you know, they got an idea for a project, they're not huge grants, you know, they're around uh, fifteen to $20,000 depending on the project. And, uh, but, you know, we've had those small grants get leveraged into really big grants from the government and from other, other sources. So um, it's been a really uh, great, great group to be involved with um so if your your listeners don't know about um lfrf check them out because they've got a lot of a lot of great resources the other thing i love we do every um so many years is uh review all the universities and and rate them based on how they're doing with organic agriculture and um some of them don't like our our findings but it definitely (laughs) the the fire to keep some of those university acreages in in uh, certified organic production one of the things I, I I think I've said it before on the show, one of the things I love about organic farmers is that they're some of the busiest people I know. And, and yet oftentimes they've got their fingers in these other pots that are not, you know, I mean, it's no small thing to be the president of the board of a, of a national nonprofit, but you, you figure out how to fit it in. So congratulations and way to go on that. Yeah, I appreciate that. It definitely, I owe a lot to my, my wife for picking up, picking up uh, the pieces when I have to deal with that and. Yeah, it's, and it's always it's great to be working with the great board of, uh, of a lot of other people and a great staff too. Great. With that, let's turn to the lightning round. So, what's your favorite tool on the farm? What uh, I mean, my my favorite tool is my snips. Um, and uh, oh, what did I do with them? They're an ARS. It's a red handled ARS pair of snips, and I I wouldn't be able to do what I do. Without them, I mean, I love my wheel hoe, but I'm not as much as my snips. The wheel hoe is obviously a lot more uh, burden. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> less on the fun side of things. Exactly. So, and and the the ARS snips. So these, um, is there a particular model that you like? Oh gosh, I can't remember the model, but it's a pretty simple model. It's a super lightweight one, and it just has a spring. Um, and they just they they hold an edge really well, and um, they've got really good action, which when you're cutting you know thousands of stems a day, it, it becomes really important, um, so that your your wrist uh, doesn't doesn't die. 
yeah, that that spring to come back and and not have to have that motion with your hand or that uh, that little bit of exertion, I think, is really important for repetitive motion syndrome. Yeah, which is hard to avoid, but it makes it a little better. <laughs> and where do you get those? We've gotten them in the past from A.M. Leonard and Gemplers, uh, as well as a couple other places. If you if you can search online. And what's your favorite crop to grow? I gotta say. This year, my favorite crop is the peony. It just, you know, it, this year was, uh, they take about five or six years to really become productive. And this year, uh, last year, we had a bad frost on our peonies. Sometimes we get some late frosts here and they can hit peonies just like it can apricots and peaches. And this year, they just went off. And it was really the first time that this patch um, has produced in in that way. And it really just... It was like, it was just so much fun, you know, thousands and thousands of stems of peony every morning and every evening. You got to harvest um, two times a day when they, when they go. Um, and we store them at the marshmallow stage. So you sort of wait for them to get poofy, but not open. And then you store them dry and then you um, can pull them out three, four weeks, five weeks is pushing it, but you can get away with it depending on the variety and you cut them. Strip, then we strip them and cut them and put them in warm water, and then they open up and they last for you know three to five days. But God, they're amazing in their smell. In in China, if you're in love, you give someone a peony, not a rose. And and uh, you know once you work around them long enough, you know why. All right, there's a tip for all the single farmers out there. <laughs> That's right, exactly. Fortunately, it has a short season. <laughs> well, it, <laughs> and I suppose for the married farmers too. You know, we shouldn't uh, uh, maybe even everybody. more so. <laughs> <laughs> Although it doesn't flowers, you know, I got to do a really amazing design to get anywhere with flowers around here. <laughs> <laughs> and if you could go back in time and tell your beginning farmer self one thing, what would it be? I would have told myself to um, spend more time learning on someone else's dime and and go to a, go to go check out big farms. Um, you know, we're we're in the process now of really just. Um, finally got a, a, a Chalmers and a G and when um, looking for a cub and I really want to transition this farm into more mechanical cultivation, you know, but I wish, I wish I'd, I'd gone and worked on a 50 acre, 100 acre farm and, and really seen bigger systems. We always, the interns that we get here who really do want to go on on farming, you know, we try to send them off to to see bigger operations, even if all they want to do is run, you know, a three acre garden, it it never can hurt to go see, see how, how they do it on a, on a bigger operation. Don, thank you so much for, for sharing your Monday afternoon here with us. You are welcome. I appreciate it. Thank you for uh, getting all these voices out there. It's been fun for me to listen to them. All right, so wrapping things up here, I'll say again that this is episode 80 of the Farmer to Farmer podcast, and that you can find the notes for this show at farmertofarmerpodcast.com by looking on the episodes page or just searching for Laroe. That's L-A-R-E-A-U. Don't forget, you can support the show by going to farmertofarmerpodcast.com slash donate. I'm not going to beat you over the head with it, but your support does make a difference, whether you make your Amazon purchases through our affiliate link, provide ongoing support through Patreon, or make a one-time donation. It all helps us keep the tractor running. farmertofarmerpodcast.com slash donate. If you enjoy the podcast, I'll bet you'd like being on the email list, The Flying Rutabaga. You can check that out at farmertofarmerpodcast.com or purplepitchfork.com. Also, please do head on over to iTunes, leave us a review if you enjoy the show, or talk to us in the show notes, or tell your friends on Facebook. We're at Purple Pitchfork on Facebook. Your reviews and referrals make a huge difference in our ability to reach out to an ever-growing circle of listeners. One more thing, I appreciate so much all of the guest suggestions that I received through the suggestions form on farmertofarmerpodcast.com. This interview was the result of one of those suggestions. Please let me know who you would like to hear from, and I'll do my best to get them on the show. Thank you for listening. Be safe out there and keep that tractor running.